let me start by doing what I always tell my students not to do, um, and and sort of explain what's up. Um, so here's what this book isn't, um, and then I'll say a little bit more about what it is. So um, I am I'm a historian. I'm not particularly a historian of Buddhism, which is kind of odd that I've written in this book about this monk, and I'll explain how that came to be the case. That may help explain some of the things that I find interesting about his career, and also maybe help explain some of the things that um, I've not paid as much attention to as you might expect uh, in his career. Um, the other thing, and maybe we can do this in discussion, um, I'm, I'm not particularly formal by nature, and um, so I was told to talk for 25 or 30 minutes and then have Q&A. Um, I may err on the side of Q&A, so I will uh, like to have some discussion. But one thing I resist about this book is calling it a biography. And we can have some discussion about why that may or may not be the case, and whether you think you can push me towards saying it is a biography and just owning that and making it my own, or push away and understand more boldly why it's not a biography. <laughs> Pay no attention to the woman behind the curtain. Um, <laughs> okay, so now, as for uh, Tan Shu himself, let me give a little bit of introduction. So there he is. Um, Tan Shu. Um, so there's his dates, 1875 to 1963. Um, you know, he's got um, additional names. Wang Futing would have been the name that he was known for mostly in the first half of his life. And then the second half of his life is when he's a Buddhist monk. Now, if you've if you've read the book, or if you've talked to, um, or if I've talked to you, you may you may know that Wang um, that Tan Shu actually doesn't become a monk until um, the middle of his life. Um, he becomes he becomes a monk when he's in his early 40s, um, and that's really the center of one of the of the kind of moral crises that he that he invites uh, and takes part in. Um, what I think this book is about is really not about Buddhism per se. Um, it's not even about Tan Shu's life specifically. What I think this book is about is about moving between and among worlds. Um, and that includes the author and the subject, that includes um, the religious and the secular, that includes the modern and the traditional, that includes China and not China, um, which is often China in the West, but not necessarily just China in the West. And the reason that I got into that comes from this map than of, of China that we can show right here. So I first encountered uh, Tan Shu when I was doing research for my dissertation, um, which then became a first book, which then, t which is about Harbin, right? So I was a pretty China savvy crowd, I think, right? So we're up in the Northeast. So when I was up in, in Harbin, which every place in, everywhere except China is called Manchuria, right? So being in, in Harbin, if you've been there, or if you know anything about it, you'll know A, it's cold, and B, it's not a very typically Chinese city, right? So it's a, a lot of um, Russian architecture, a lot of European architecture, a lot of Japanese influence, not a typical Chinese city. Um, I was there studying, studying language. Um, I was at the CET program in, in Harbin in the early 90s. Um, and one of the things that we would do is we'd go to different you know, cultural sites. And one of the cultural sites was the one Buddhist temple in Harbin, which very odd, and it's very odd in a way that seems to me important. Um, it's, it stands out like a sore thumb. Um, and as I was there, I came across the memoirs of this monk, who I then later learned and talked to some of the monks who were there, um, had founded the temple, and they had a copy of his, um, of his memoir, which I, that's where I first got it, and I looked at it, and I noted that he founded temples in these other places, so it included Changchun, and Shenyang, both of which have large, especially Russian communities, but it's also Japanese communities. Um, Qingdao, which is you know really, which was a, a, you know full-blown colony right for for a period of time. Um, Xi'an, which doesn't quite fit the model in terms of his colonial endeavors, and winds up in, in Hong Kong. So the wheels that started turning on this were okay. I've been told, as a historian and as a student, that Buddhism is not particularly political. Right? That there's not there's not a political agenda being advanced by these Buddhist monks. But this clearly seemed, something seems fishy, that he's choosing these particular places to build temples. So I became really curious about that. Um, so that's the story I decided to then pick up later, a few years later, and at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll 
give you some of the details about why that becomes interesting. But this first, the moving between worlds is this world of the traditionally Chinese and the colonial or the semi-colonial or the, or the foreign. If this is one, like, would this work? So I'm, I'm grabbing this thread and, and tugging on it a bit. Can As I start, a quick sir, question? please. Is, is that the historical sequence, temporal sequence in which he founded them? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, so he, Yingko is where he's born and grows up. He then goes first to Changchun and Shenyang, he, where he founds temples, doesn't spend a lot of time there. Harbin he is in for a while. He flees Harbin when the Japanese invade, goes, goes to Xi'an. He's in Xi'an for a little while. Qingdao is where he spends the bulk of his career, actually during the Japanese occupation, which we can talk about. And then he goes to Hong Kong, lives there the, at when the communists take over, and lives the last 14 years of his life in Hong Kong. Yep, and I should have made that, made that clear. Um, okay, the next world that he's moving between, as I started reading the biography in the first couple of days, is the world, moving between the world of the living and the world of the dead. Because very early in the book, um, Tan Xu dies. Which usually happens at the end of, of a memoir, but in this case it happens at the beginning. Um, and he becomes quite clear. He says, you know, I know what you're thinking. He says, I know you're thinking that I, you know, I hallucinated, that I died and I had this vision, I had this dream, and I went to dealt with, you know, dealt with the king of hell and had to negotiate going back to, going back to life. Um, you have every reason to think that's what happened. That's not what happened. What happened is I actually died and I met with these people. So here's what I'll give you up to speed. So he dies when he's, uh, I think he was 18 years old, 19 years old. Um, up until that point, he'd been living in the area. Do we have the map here? Yeah. So he'd been living right around here. Mm -hmm. Can't tell how well how strong the light is. He'd been living near what's now Tianjin, a village called Beitang, which is now really an outer suburb of, of Tianjin. Um, but he'd been growing up in that in that region. His father was a merchant sailor who was sailing around the Bohai Gulf. Um, he tried to get in a variety of different family businesses, so that included um, selling tobacco. Um, they'd grow tobacco up in up in uh, Shenyang. Go there in the summertime, where they'd grow. Family, if you've been in Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut River Valley, they grow that big, thick tobacco for wrapping cigars, and they also grew that in, um, in Dongbei. Um, but he, um, he was the only surviving child of his parents. Now, he had had six or seven siblings, and the fact that he doesn't know if it was six or seven is instructive, right? Mm -hmm. So none of, these, none of these children had survived to even to adolescence, right? So they had all died. Her, her, uh, his parents expected that they were going to die, die childless. Then um, later in life, they're surprised by Tan Xu. He's born and he, he grows up to the age of 18 when he dies. This becomes important then for when he goes down to the underworld and he has a very elaborate description of all this going on. Um, and he says, look, this would be, this, this is too cruel, right? So if, if, I'm, if I die, then that means my <coughs> particularly my mother, because he didn't see his father very often. His father is traveling around as a, as a merchant. And my mother is going to be left with no one to take care of her, with no one to um, support either her physically or honor her memory. Can we do something? And King of Hell gives him, makes him a deal. He says, you can go back if you um, will recite, he, he times you change these stories a bit, but if you recite these certain Buddhist sutras. Now the reason the story changes a bit, and this is one of the other, the other worlds that Tan Shu is moving back and forth between, is that he becomes very much a spiritual seeker. Um, so he tries Catholicism on for size, he tries Taoism on for size, he tries Buddhism on for size, he goes to all these different ones. In fact, he talked about how his friends would make fun of him um, because he had all these different, I mean, to hear him tell the story, he would have figurines of, of Catholic saints um, right next to Buddhist sutra text and right next to um, you know, images of Taoist immortals. Of course, from a Chinese perspective, that's all completely, makes complete sense um, that you would have these different traditions intertwining. But for, for Tan Shu, what he ultimately latches on to is that Buddhism is the way that he's going to move forward. We'll get back to a little bit of what that means in a moment. So there's the map. Any, ge any geographical questions? Any clarifying at the moment? In doing presentation on this, I often find I need a, I need a map, and so I stick them in occasionally and go back to it. Okay, <clears throat> as he goes on through his life and determines that, um, oh, sorry, back up. Growing up in Northeast China, he is confronted regularly by the 
what you read in the you know, in the histories of, of the era. So Boxer Uprising and it's um, well, sorry, we'll go in order. Sino-Japanese War is happening right on his front yard, right? So he's seeing Japanese and Chinese armies fighting against each other and the Chinese getting the short end of that stick. He's seeing the Boxer Uprising happening right in front of him and that's being suppressed and put down by, by foreign armies and he has a really heartrending series about uh, seeing the, the casualties of that conflict. Then he sees the um, Russo-Japanese War, which is not involving China per se, but is fought entirely in China. Um, so he sees all these things going on. So this is the conversation I was having with um, with, with Jeff Wasis, who many of you know is a, a eminent historian of 20th century China, talking about how one of the reasons why Tan Shu and people like Tan Shu, I think, don't get noticed is because they don't really fit into the categories that we have established. So one of the categories that we have are traditionalists. So there are people who would say that what China needs is to build back on its traditions and reject foreign influences. Another model would be the modernizer, right? The modernizer that China needs to reject its traditional past and move forward into something um, more modern, often more Western. Tan Shu comes to the conclusion, looking at all this, that right, China can't go on as it is. It's just getting beaten left, right, and center by the Russians, by the Germans, by the British, by the French, by the Japanese. So it needs to clearly do something different. But what he sees, both for the Japanese and for the Europeans, Americans he doesn't deal with as much directly, um, is what he feels is that their advantage is not in superior armaments or superior technology, that their advantage is in a, a spiritual foundation that he thinks enables them to prosper and succeed. Christianity in the case of the Europeans, Buddhism in the case of the Japanese, he doesn't think that China needs to become Christian. He thinks that China needs to look back into its own past and its own traditions and find what its spiritual foundation, which he says is Buddhism. Now, apologies to my teachers and graduates who <coughs> emphasized over and over again that Buddhism is not Chinese. For Tan Shu, it was, right? So Tan Shu felt that the reason why, the, the way that China was going to go forward was by becoming um, a Buddhist nation and a modern Buddhist nation. So he wanted both those things together. So he was neither quite a traditionalist nor a modernizer. At this point, and Margo and I just talked about this in the, uh, a few minutes ago, um, at this point he has a decision to make. So how is he going to become, how is he going to help advance China's cause to become a modern, successful Buddhist nation? And he decides that the way to do that is become a Buddhist monk. He tries to do this a couple of times and he's turned away. And finally in 1910, so in 1910 he is 35 years old, he leaves he actually lies to his wife and says, I'm going out to ten for Qingming Festival, I'm going to ten, you know, to ten gravestones and splits, goes to Beijing. They're living in Ningpo at the at the time. Um, and goes to become a monk. And he is in a, a scene that is somewhere between well, it's it's a bizarre scene. He goes back to he goes back to her a year later or so. Um, and can't understand why she's She's really unhappy with him. <laughs> Wife and seven kids. But she's. Um, <laughs> and I felt that this was. You know, when I was doing the research for the book, um, I was presenting it, that chapter, and one of the people listening says, Well, I just think you've done a good job because oftentimes biographers you know, become so enamored of their subject that they present them as being you know, perfect figures. And, and this guy seems like an asshole. <laughs> with apologies. Um, so I felt like I had done good, I think. Um, so anyhow, um, he decides to then become a Buddhist monk, and he goes then to Ningbo, which is where he, he goes to Beijing, he's trained for a while, and then they say, where well, you need to go is Ningbo, because there's no good Buddhism in the north, all the Buddhism is in the south. When he goes to the south, he's a really valuable commodity, and this is something I think is important to, to emphasize, is anyone who's, you know, if you've traveled extensively in China, the idea that there are Chinese dialects is, you know, is a misnomer. There's different languages that people speak in different parts of the country. So when you go to the South, he doesn't understand what people are saying. He doesn't like the food. He doesn't like the weather. He doesn't like anything about it, but he's really, really valuable because he can go to the North and help spread Buddhism. So they're, they think he's really important. And that catapults him then into the career that he goes on um, to have. This is the temple that was taken a couple of years ago. It's still it was still there. I think it's gone now. I think it's been turned into a even better temple 
Um, <laughs> even better temple. So they had the, they had the plans that they were working on. I was fortunate because I was there. I could actually go to the room that he had stayed in, and it had the. I don't know if it was the original floor or not, but it was certainly an old floor. Now it's the in marble in China. So then he goes back up north. Um, he goes back north to Yinko. Yinko is where he lived. Yinko is probably not a place you've heard of. Um, it was also known as Nyojuang, um, and it was a treaty port. Um, and so there was uh, an American consul in, in Nyojuang, and it had a, a bund down on the, on the waterfront, which had a number of foreign buildings. There weren't any, there was no Buddhist temple there. So his first idea was, I want to build a Buddhist temple there, not because it needs to be um, sinified, not because we need to have a Chinese presence there, because this is where he had grown up. He wanted to learn more about Buddhism, and there wasn't a Buddhist temple there, so he establishes it. But we're now talking, we're now in 1917, 18, 20, 1920, I think this temple opened. Um, we're now to the point that um, people start, uh, officials in other cities start to notice what he's doing. And that's, if you remember, then the list that you were just asking about of temples. Um, he gets invited to Shenyang, to Changchun, and then ultimately to Harbin. So then this would be the picture of, of Harbin that you may be familiar with. The, 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 the code, the quick and dirty code here is it's in black and white. It was destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. If it's in color, it's still there. So um, St. Nicholas Church, which is the um, center of one part of town, um, which was destroyed in 1966, um, as was the, the church uh, in the lower left. This church is still there. The Catholic Church in this, which you can't see very well, that was the American consulate. Um, but this was, I mean, this was Harbin, this was this kind of, they were very proud to say that European fashions got to Harbin first, because they would go across the, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, get the Harbin, and then go down into, into the rest of China. Um, let's see what I, how many images I put here. Just the one, so I'll do this shtick here. What he then did here, did I not include a photo for that temple? Didn't shame on me. Um, what he does when he gets to Harbin is he's commissioned to build a temple. It's called the Jila so the Paradise Temple. And if you look at Harbin on a, an overhead map, you'll see that the, the square, which is circular, um, where this church is, runs down Dajujie, right, the big straight street, runs down past these some of these churches, not all of them, and then to the Russian cemetery. So you've got this straight line, and it's a cruciform. So you've got one crossing, and then you've got this long boulevard. What the city officials do is they invite Tanshu into the city to build a Buddhist temple, and then they commission a Confucian temple, which are built right opposite one another, right by the entrance to the Russian cemetery. So my argument, this was in the, the dissertation, my argument was this was done explicitly and on purpose so that they could you know, say to the Russians, you know, you're not in... St. Petersburg anymore, right? that this is, this is Chinese territory, this is a Chinese place. And, and Tan Shu is very explicit about that. Um, I'm probably going on too long, so I'm not going to read what he wrote about it. But he said, I'm going to build this temple, and this temple is going to be a marker to show how this is a Chinese, is a Chinese city. Um, he does the same thing in, in Qingdao, right? So he's gone on to Qingdao. He's brought there by city officials. The city officials say this is, um, you know, it had been a, we're now in 1920. No, we're into the 1930s when he goes to he goes to Qingdao. Um, the city officials say this is a German. You know, it's, it's a beautiful city, but it's too European looking. We don't have enough Chinese presence. We don't have any Chinese Buddhism. Um, we won't have a temple there. It's going to serve it. So these are the images that you would have of of Qingdao, and even today, this is the image of Qingdao is promoted, right? The brewery, the beaches, and German architecture, right? And so this is what is what he builds in in uh, Qingdao, which is the, the Jianshan Temple, um, which is a beautiful, sprawling temple on the hill overlooking the rest of the city. Um, you know, nothing noteworthy about it. It's, I mean, in, their, in most other Chinese cities, there'd be nothing really noteworthy about it. It'd be kind of a large temple. But in Qingdao, it's built there uh, specifically and on, and on purpose. Um, we may come back to this in the Q&A. This was the hardest part of the book to write because in Qing, he's in Qingdao starting in the mid 1930s so then the war breaks out in 37 and he's working in Qingdao as abbot of the temple for most of this time period all throughout World War II. Right, so from 1937 through 1945 and then stays after that. 
So the question is, what was his relationship like with the Japanese? Was he a collaborator? Was he not? Those are questions that I don't know the answers to. I made some suggest about it. We haven't talked about it with you. But that's, that's what's going on in this, in this period. Um, there's this image from Hong Kong, the tree going from the 1960s. At this point, I have to say, with, with uh, a nod to the Princess Bride, um, so murdered by pirates is good, I would say at this point, because Tan Shu also escapes down the, down the river where he's attacked by river pirates and manages to escape with his life. But I don't have a picture for that one, so it's not very exciting. Um, he does escape to Hong Kong in 1949. Um, he's one of the last. So as the communist armies are surrounding in Shandong, um, he would, takes an American plane, which gets him out of Hong Kong, out of, uh, out of Qingdao, flies to Shanghai and then on to Hong Kong in 1949, where the, the path has been laid for him um, by his student, uh, his kind of head student, whose name is Lok To. Um, his Cantonese name is Lok To. More about him in a moment. Um, his main project when he's Hong Kong, and if you've been to Hong Kong, you may have seen this place, on Boundary Street, um, so the boundary between Kowloon and the New Territories. So this is the, the Buddhist Library of China. So what the, the idea here, and I think this fits into the same, back to the motif of moving between worlds, um, he's really now trying to hold on to a, an image of old China, of his China, in contrast to what he sees as um, the destruction of that world by the, by the communist forces. So he sees um, not only people who have worked with, actively or passively with the Japanese, but also any religious figures are in some jeopardy as the communists are, are attacking um, or conquering. And so at that point, um, Buddhist texts are in jeopardy, so he, he begins collecting Buddhist texts and establishes this library, which is here in, in Kowloon. And that's where he winds up in Hong Kong. This is in Clearwater Bay, um, overlooking in a remarkably beautiful spot. Um, and so this is his uh, stupa, or his, his um, where the surya, where the, the, the relics are left. So after, after a Buddhist master is cremated, there's some relics that are, that are left, and they would be inside this, inside this stupa. Um, now, I have a better picture of it here. That's what it looked like in 2007, I think, when I was there. Just some images to give you the whole thing. Um, all right, so let me bring this back then to this idea of, of different worlds. So I came, so the story that I just sketched in, in very hazy outline, and I'm happy to fill in some more details because I you knew we didn't have a lot of time and I wanted to just get through the highlights. Um, it's kind of, I had an academic argument, right, okay, so Buddhism, nationalism, I'd written about nationalism before, Buddhism seemed an interesting take on to it, and so the idea of building Buddhist temples in European cities, right, that seemed to have something I can maybe get a book out of it, certainly an article out of it, but it seemed something was there. Now, I put that first project to bed in about 2000, 2001, and then went on and you know, had life, and then went back to this new book <laughs> to go, as I went right about Tan Shu, about five or six years later. Now, in those intervening five or six years, the internet happened, right? So, in 1999 and 2000, I, there was not, there may have been Google, but it wasn't, wasn't using it, right? And so in 2005, I went back to go look at, um, to go look at Tan Shu's career, and I said, huh, I wonder what this Google thing is. So I Googled it. And what came up was, um, and I describe this in the prologue of the book, what came up were a couple of different hits. And one of the hits was a, a, um, a commentary on the Heart Sutra, which is where the title of Heart of Buddha, Heart of China comes from, this commentary on the Heart Sutra. Um, that he'd written had been translated into English and was widely disseminated in the United States. And I said, well, I don't see how this is going to be directly relevant to this book, but I should have it. I mean, it's, it's there. So I write off to the, the YMBA, which who knew that the YMBA was a thing? I could do that. Yeah. Um, so the YMBA was a thing. I write to them, and he says, oh, Tan Shu, the, for, uh, you're, probably, you're, you're probably interested in Master Tai Shu. So if, you're, if you know Buddhism, so Tai Shu is a much bigger figure. Um, in reforming modern Buddhism in the middle of the 20th century. Um, so probably turned in Taishu, and I said, no, actually, I know Taishu, no, it's just, I'm Taishu. He said, well, that's great, you must know Master Lok To. And I said, I, no, I don't. <laughs> so he writes me back, it turns out that Lok To, who I'd mentioned before, he's one who had been his student in Qingdao and had paved the way for him to fly to Hong Kong 
um, and helped establish him in, in Hong Kong. Turns out that Lockteau was not only still alive, um, he was still alive and in the United States and practicing at a temple in the Bronx. <laughs> um, I live in New Jersey, so I was in Philadelphia <laughs> working on this, or getting all this, and so I'm like, yeah, I'm like, uh, like, whoa, like this never happens, like the historians. That's why I'm a historian, so I don't, so things don't like this don't happen. This is great. Um, so I start, I go up to the YMBA and meet with Master Lockteau. So this was, this picture used to be current, now it's just showing how much I've aged in the time I've been doing this project. Um, but this is, um, so this is in the YMBA. This is at, um, in the Bronx. It's right near Fordham. Um, so if you know where the armory is, um, it's, it's just down the street from, from that. Um, so this is Master Lockteau, who passed away two years ago. Um, I wrote about, I wrote about Lockteau in, um, so there's a volume that Angelie Shaw and Jeff Washington edited called Chinese Characters. I had a chapter in that on Lockteau. Um, and his funeral was the, his was September 10th, 2011. So it was on the eve of the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Of, uh, of and it was surreal, because it was in Queens. So I was driving you know, up the BQE uh, the night before September 11th, and it was, it was you know, every, you couldn't get into Manhattan during Lower Manhattan, anything was closed. It was, it was really, really surreal. Um, can be really surreal, anyway. <laughs> um, so this is Lockteau. Um, this is Tan Xu. Um, so this was, I mean, as a historian, this was quite the thing to, I mean, I had a picture of Tan Xu, I'd seen pictures of Tan Xu, but this guy has this, you know, colored portrait of him, which is right there. Um, there's me. Um, so then what happened as a result of this, and, and that we can kind of lead on into Q&A on this, is that um, Locteau was able to give me a photograph. This photograph actually served, as I said, this can be your passport. So because of this, Locteau was still technically the abbot of of uh, this monastery. He hadn't been there in, in several years, but he was officially the abbot, so I could go there and I could spend as much time there as I wanted to, and I was also able to go to the monastery at Tiantai, um, so Tan Shu was a Tiantai patriarch, and so I could go and I lived there for a couple of weeks. Um, the hottest place I've ever been. With the mosquitoes. With the mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> and also to Qingdao, so I was able to go to all these different places, uh, and to Ningbo, so I could really trace his route. And that's the part that as a book, and I, you can judge for yourself how well it succeeded, but I think that the, again, this moving between worlds, it wasn't, you know, a biography of Tan Shu, I, mean, I think his life is interesting, and I think there are things in there that are really, that draw parallels with modern China's experience, but I think what made it, for me, a meaningful project, beyond just simply an interesting one, um, was the fact that I could get this kind of access to go to these places where he had been, um, and talk to the people that he had not just that he had influenced, but people who knew him spent time with him, and then was able to go and interrogate um, those different pieces. So I think that's the last slide, and it's 6.30. So with that, I will stop and we can just have questions and discussion. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Any questions? Marty? Then why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, okay, Jen. Martin Rivlin from Columbia and CUNY. Um, I was curious about your comment that Buddhism, you said this half in jest and half seriously, mm -hmm. that Buddhism was not supposed to be political. And um, if I think of my experience in Japan, mm -hmm. I would say that's definitely... Um, in that period, right, sure. Yeah. So I'm curious as to what you were going to say about it. Yeah, um, okay, so... So I'll, I'll explain the comment first. So the comment first was really meant to, to really go into the histori historiography. So in China, the notion is that, okay, Buddhist is not, Buddhism is not an activist religion. So this is why you, you don't have in the same way that in some other traditions you have, you have big social movements that are led by the, the church, right, by, by Buddhism. Um, and so this was just kind of a contradiction to that because the idea that um, Buddhism, because it's supposed to be individual because it's supposed to be you know, denying of the material world, it's supposed to be focusing on the, the, the real life which is the hereafter rather than the, the current life that it would not be a particularly political um, movement. And for Tan Shu, although he wasted no opportunity to deny that he was political, clearly he was. 
I mean, he was built. He was working with political authorities and political leaders to build temples with an explicitly culturally political agenda. So that's all I meant with, with the comment. Um, it's a bit of a straw man, so I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. I also think that um, with Japan, though, because this became really interesting. So in 1925, he, he goes to Japan as part of this pan-Asian Buddhist movement that the Japanese were trying to use to you know, start to build the foundation for what would become the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. And, and Tanchi is disgusted by it. Um, you know, he, he objects to what he sees as the secular life that the Japanese monks are living, and he doesn't like to see the um, politiz politicization of, of Buddhist monks that he perceives going on in Japan. So clearly the intersection of Buddhism and politics is, is not at all as simple as saying, well, it's not supposed to be political, but it clearly is. It's being actively promoted as being political. Tanshu himself was recruited to go work with the Japanese in Japan, which he refused. But two of his closest students, not Lakuto, but two of his closest students did go to Japan. So I think that if, if you were to argue that Tan Shu was in fact a collaborator, if you had to put him in a category, he was a collaborator, I, I, I couldn't disagree with that. And I think he was clearly at least willing to passively work with the Japanese so that he could continue to promote his, his vision of Buddhism, um, period. Jan? <laughs> yeah. I have... Like who who five, are you? Uh, I'm Jan Barris with the National Committee, and I have four or five different questions left. So <laughs> let me ask all of them. Um, so let's just start with one. Go. You provocatively say he died. Of course. And he negotiated with yep. the King of Hell. Yep. So uh, <laughs> is this, we just take his word for this? Uh, did his mother and father mourn for him? Was there any other outside evidence that he really died? <laughs> No, those are really good questions. Um, so, I'll, I'll just I'll just bare my soul. <laughs> um, so, one of the things about this book that I find is frustrating is so finding an audience for this book, crassly finding a market for this book, but finding an audience for this book is <laughs> difficult because it's really a book about I think more. I think for it's, it's a history book, right? It's for it's for historians, like and, and I think it, it goes at the history of the era. I think, it's about, I think it's about writing history. Um, Steve Platt did a nice review of it, which I think he got it. So but he's a historian, so he'd get it. Um, so I think that, that how you deal with the sources, only third of all is it really about Tan Shu and about Buddhism. I think that's really the third thing. So I've learned some lessons for, for the horse search. Um, OK, so to, so to answer your question, the, um, no, we have, we have very little outside. We have no outside evidence that he actually died. Right? So we're relying on him. Now, as a historian, this book presents a lot of problems, and so this may be, um, it's a problem, I may acknowledge that. The sources, for my main source I'm relying on are his memoirs, right? So I cross-reference, I've looked in some archives in different places, and I get, get newspaper accounts and some other things that cross-reference certain things that happened. But for the narrative, for a lot of these things, I'm relying on his, on his accounts. So when he say things that, as a 21st century secular humanist, clearly could not have happened, what do I do? So I, I kind of have three choices. One, I accept them at face value and say this is what actually happened. Right? Two, I say, well, this is impossible, so he, you know, he's, he's delusional, right? he was sick, he was hallucinating, he had a high fever, and he imagined this stuff. Or third, which is what I do, which is present what he says at face value. I'm not commenting as to whether he died or not. You do too. What, what do I? No. What do I say? You're pretty dubious that he's died. Sure, I am dubious, but I don't say he didn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I would try to be, I try to be as honest as I can. Like he, he claims he died. I have no evidence to say that he didn't die, except that, except that he lived. my life as a as a 21st century scholar suggests that people don't die and then come back, right? So, so I present that at, at kind of a, at face value. So, what other? So, did his parents mourn? He, he, it was for a day, right? So, what happened? What there are two things that happened. So, he was getting married, and he was getting married the day after his best friend was getting married. So, there were these two weddings that were happening in consecutive days, um, and 
what happened was the day before that his best friend had gotten sick and had died. And so he writes very, very movingly about how the, his, his friend's bride had had a change from red dress one day to a white dress you know, the next day, from, from a wedding down to a morning, to morning dress. Um, and then he feels himself start to get sick and you know, takes to bed. And then he goes and has this long negotiation. So, OK, if, you, if Margo now is going to out me. No, I don't think he died, because that's not what people do. But, but on the other hand, you know, I think that he believes this happened, and so therefore I think it's relevant to his story going forward. Is that sufficiently clear? No. I'll wait to see if I have questions. Tom? Uh, um, uh, for those of us who have... Who are you? Uh, hmm? the Tom Bell Open Society Foundation. Um, uh, perhaps the least qualified to comment on historical matters in this uh, room. Um, but that's not going to stop me from asking this question, uh, which is to say, can you say a little bit more about his uh, politics and, uh, for those of us who have not read the book, uh, his decision to leave the mainland uh, for uh, Hong Kong in 1949? Do you think that he was worried about being perceived as a political collaborator and that staying uh, on the mainland would be dangerous for him? Mm -hmm. or were there other dynamics? No, he definitely thought that staying in the mainland would be, would be dangerous for him. Yeah. Um, I think the more complicated question is why he thought it would be dangerous for him. Now, in some ways, it doesn't matter because they both lead to the same answer. But it was either because he would be perceived as being a collaborator, the evidence for which was he had lived for 14 years you know, under Japanese occupation and lived to tell the tale. So QED, right? He's a collaborator. Um, other alternative would be that he, um, because religious leaders and religious figures were not particularly popular with the communists, and there were stories about different Buddhist, particularly Buddhist leaders, um, who had been put in prison or executed by the communist armies after they had taken over. Um, now, Tan Shu is very explicit, and this is interesting because his memoir, right, he's writing the memoir, so he has control over what he says. He was very explicit. He says, I did not resist the Japanese. He said, some of, like, they arrested me. I'll, I'll, I'll be myself. They arrested him and, um, and charged him with, with leading an armed resistance group against the Japanese. And he went very close. I didn't do that. Right? So, I mean, he, it would have been much easier afterward to say, you know, proof that I was not a collaborator was that the Japanese you know, found out that I had been resisting. He said it wasn't. He also said that he wasn't, um, um, so he said he wasn't, collab or wasn't actively resisting them. Um, he said he wasn't involved in politics. He was running this temple. And there was another, there was a Japanese Buddhist temple in Qingdao as well. So he wasn't primarily serving um, Japanese. He was working with both, with mostly Chinese um, and talked about how um, they would provide for both their spiritual needs, but also had a garden. And when, when the war effort went through and the more and more resources were being diverted, to Japan or Japanese armies that they provided you know, to grow food. And there's no way to corroborate a lot of that. It's, it's, it, can be, it could be very self-serving. Um, but when he leaves in 49, it's because he fears for his safety. Whether it's because they think he's a collaborator or because they think he's a religious leader, in some ways it doesn't really matter. But he leaves in 49 and goes to to Hong Kong. With the wife and seven children? No, no, they're, 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 they're long gone. Yeah, they're long gone. Oh, so she didn't take him back? No. He's a monk? He's a monk. Well, What's to take some, back? Some, no. some monks <laughs> have families. No, he does, no, he does not. He goes, sorry, he, so he goes back and sees her, kind of just to check in and say, I mean, he says, and you can, like throw things at him. He, says, he says, well, you should be happy, because I could be dead. But I'm not dead, I'm just, uh, I just left you. <laughs> and did he leave her with any means? Was he a wealthy man and left her money? Or? No, he had been, um, these are details that I didn't go through. So he had been working as a, um, uh, as, a, as a, a pharmacist, for lack of a better word. Like, so he did kind of traditional Chinese medicine, like hung out a shingle and a fortune teller, right? So he had hung out a shingle. So he, was, he, was, he wasn't poor, he wasn't rich, but he was, he was somewhere in the middle. Um, um, he left her with the expectation that she was going to be cared for by the, by the kind of community, the, the would-be Buddhist community that, again, didn't have a temple at that point. And that does, in fact, appear to be what happens. Um, but he doesn't, uh, no, he doesn't, you know, leave 
like but he doesn't fashion. write much about all of no, this. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. We don't even know her name. We don't know her name. So um, no remorse or <laughs> concern about. You have to read the book. <laughs> um, I think that. <laughs> no, I think that. Um, no, there there are two episodes that are really problematic. And, uh, and if I were a more, if I were a different kind of well, I can say historian, but if I were a different kind of person, I, I just I might not be able to, to write this because I because these, these are problematic issues. So the first is that episode. I would I I would have given a lot of I would have given a lot to find her side of the story, but I couldn't find. It. So I, I did my best, and, and Margot can evaluate how well I did, but I tried to just simply put out what he did, what the consequen and what the consequences were, would have been for her. Right? And, and I think it, it, does, it does speak to the privilege of being a man in the society. So he had options. So I think he thought very carefully about what his responsibilities and what his obligations and what his options were. But in the end, he made a selfish decision that was going to support him it wasn't just selfish, but it was a selfish decision. Um, and his wife had very few options. And the option she was most especially without was the, the option to decide. Right? I mean, she was, she was left with very few, very few uh, choices to make. So that's, that's one. And I tried to present that through, through looking at the legal code, seeing what her options would have been as a, an effectively Divorced woman or widow? Is she divorced or widowed or somewhere in between? And it's 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 a little flip, but it's kind of true. Like which of those categories would she fall into? Um, and then the other is the Japanese occupation, because there's also there's circumstantial evidence and there's indirect ways to get at what his activities were like. But those are the two most interesting periods but of his life. Also, when he leaves the monastery. Yeah, yeah that he one. Leaves Nimue. Yeah, but that's not as morally fraught. So he also defies his his master says he can't he can't leave. Right, he has to stay in the monastery. It's like very, very Yoda and Luke kind of. He must complete the training, right? Um, <laughs> but he says he has to go off and, and help. He, I mean, he had, first of all, he has wanderlust. He likes traveling around and building things, building temples. Um, but he also doesn't. He seems to have you know, authority issues, so he doesn't want to stay there. And his master says you can't go, and he does. So he lies to his master and says, ah, of course I'm not going to go. I'm not moving closer to the door. Just looks over <laughs> and he leaves. Um, but that doesn't. I mean, so yes, that has a problem of he lies to his master. But I don't think that's in the. I don't think that's in the morally fraught category of, of leaving his wife and children without telling them where he's going, or of you know operating under Japanese occupation. Yeah. yeah. So you throw us uh, the uh, DWS mutual funds. Um, clearly, his life was. Pretty interesting, and, and he did a lot of stuff. Um, in terms of looking back, apart from the physical aspects of the temples, uh, some of which these remain, what, what was his impact, if you will? What, what was his legacy within uh, within China itself? Can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, his legacy within China is is material. Right, so the temples that he founded in Harbin and in Qingdao, um, in Harbin, in Qingdao, in Shenyang, I found, and in Yingkou, those temples are all still there. I've been to them. Uh, the one in Changchun he founded isn't, isn't there anymore, at least I couldn't find it. Um, and um, the temple that he was at in Hong Kong, the, the library is at. So materially, there's, there's those issues. Um, in, terms of, in terms beyond that, so he had a number of students and followers. Almost all of them left China. A lot of them are in Australia, um, and a lot of them in Canada. He, when when Lok To left, he went first to San Francisco, then to Toronto, uh, and then to New York. And in fact, the the big Chamshan Monastery, the largest one now, is in Toronto, um, where a lot of his, his legacy is. You know, Tan Shu. Part of the this is. Part of the appeal about writing about him is that he wasn't particularly well known. Um, so, you know, whereas Taishu, for students of modern of 20th century Buddhism, he's a major figure. He had a great impact on how we think about or how, how Buddhism was practiced um, in China and and beyond in the 20th century. Tanshu, his legacy, I mean, he's more conservative than that. He's not that interesting um, from a doctrinal point point of view. Um, so he has these students who are around the world in Australia and Canada. 
and well, Watteau is now passed away, so I'm not sure what this, I mean, I'm still in touch with some of his, his people um, in, in Westchester now, for the most part, um, but, um, but his legacy isn't, you know, he, he wasn't a, a grand mover of, of, of the Buddhist needle in that regard. Can you just talk about the memoir of John Lowitz, it's national. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the, the memoir itself? Mm -hmm. Is this something that Buddhist masters did? Mm -hmm. And is there, uh, where is the, the value to, the, to his own movement that it was preserved as opposed to, to, histor to historical record? Sure. Okay. So this will go. This will answer a little bit of your question in a slightly different way too. So, <coughs> well, his influence today is mainly in terms of these temples that he founded, which are now being rehabilitated because they're potentially ways of making money as tourist sites, right? In the mainland, to be crass about it. Um, so his influence then, uh, he was a, he was a pretty important influential figure. So Holmes Welch, you know, would be the person to to read, right? And he wrote historian had been at, at Wisconsin, right, trained at Harvard, uh, wrote about comparative religion, died in the 80s, rather young, but he's written the Buddhist revival in China, he talks a lot about Tan Shu. Tan Shu was, was an important figure in the 20s and the 30s, training these figures, particularly, tra sorry, training Buddhists, and particularly in the north, because there wasn't, you know, Buddhism was largely died out as too strong, but it wasn't very active in the north. So this idea of the Buddhist revival, which happens in China in the 1920s and the 1930s, a lot of that is rebuilding and rehabilitating the temples in the south, but then trying to move that to the north. Okay. So, and, and as I already said, Tan Shu is valuable in this regard because he speaks, you know, because people can understand what he's saying when he goes to the north. Um, okay, so in terms of the memoir, so this memoir is recited um, by him to his students in the period after the end of the Japanese occupation uh, and before the communist victory. So in the late 1940s, right, the, the third quarter of the 1940s is when he, when he recites this. And then there are other, obviously it goes through the end of his life, so then there's pieces that are added on later. And it is kind of a standard genre. So you do have Buddhist masters who do, um, who do this. And so I talked with some scholars about how to, how to interpret those and like what are some common tropes, what are some things that you should take really seriously, what are things that you need to be much more skeptical about, and how you read them. So it's, it's common. The reason that it was done um, was, again, as somebody who's training students, who's training Buddhists, how would you get, how would his life story be a model for them? And that's why, to criticize myself, that's why you should be really skeptical of everything I just told you, right? <laughs> because what he's, he's suggesting is that, okay, he talks about when he was born, how there are these different omens, right, that foretold that he was going to be a Buddhist monk. You know, then he goes through his death experience. Um, then he goes through everything um, that led up to him becoming a monk and then going to, to tell the story. Um, I like to think that I'm able to do that as a historian, acknowledging the limitations of the source and then trying to, to balance those in the source. But, but it's definitely, I mean, the source is trying to tell you a particular story. Um, what I think is therefore so interesting as, as a source is that he often puts himself not in the best light when he's got complete control over it. Right? So he doesn't have to say any of these morally problematic things that he did, yet he does. So that means either he didn't consider them to be morally problematic, <laughs> But he does. I mean, because when he talks about leaving his wife, he says, I can't, I mean, right, he says this in the book. He says, I can't do this, because what is she, she's completely dependent on me. What is she going to do? She can't have a career. She can't have a job. She can't get remarried. How can I possibly do this? And then he decides that, that I'm doing too many science fiction references, but he decides that the needs of the many have weighed the needs of the one. So he has to go and do it. Um, but, he, but he clearly thinks about it. Well, is it the needs of the many? Is he really doing it to propagate Buddhism, or is it to satisfy his wanderlust and need to build things? Is there any can, is there any way to tell that I from talking say, to Look to or other? aside from saying false dichotomous question? Right? I mean, he's, I don't think he has to choose. I think I think I think it's both at once. Um, 
But no, there's no there's no way to tell. There's there's no way to tell. I would say that if he really just didn't want to be married anymore and wanted to like skedaddle, he didn't really have to go on and then have this big career that he did. I mean, he was he was forty. I mean, he was in his forties, and he worked. I mean, he went to the south and became ordained as a monk, and then had a career building and, and operating a number of different temples. Um, so there was enough there. There was enough commitment there to suggest that he actually thought this was a meaningful career to follow. It doesn't at all take away from you know, the really problematic circumstances that he, that he embarks on. But, and I mean, because he has two completely different lives. I mean, if you look at the average age, the average life expectancy of a, of a Chinese man born in 1875, right? So for him to live to be 40 years old, I mean, that's probably there, a lot of his generation wouldn't live to be past 40 years old. So he lives to be 40 years old and then goes on and has a whole another another life after that as a, as a Buddhist monk. No, you have to ask Margo. Sure. We have time for one more question? I think so. We have one Bill, new one. Bill, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, Bill Ironbrust, the retired journalist. How common was it then, or is it now, for people, say, middle-aged already, to become monks? Um, he was unusual. I mean, at the time, it was unusual because he was he was quite old to become a Buddhist, to become a monk, to start to start becoming a monk at that age. Most of the people who were doing it were were young. This was, though, as I alluded to a bit, this was part of this Buddhist revival. So I, I just very briefly said he tried to become a monk before and was turned away. So there were just I mean, it was sort of like the Great Awakening in the United States. I mean, so you would have these these prayer meetings, and you would have thousands of people show up, and they would all then go to these, go to these monks, because you need to you know, have, a, have a teacher who's going to train you to be a monk, so these monks would be overwhelmed with people, especially in the north, where there weren't very many who could do it. They say, you know, there, there's too many. Um, so he tried a few times, and most, one of the reasons that he wasn't able to become trained earlier is that he, you know, he was too old. I, I don't. I think for practical reasons. That, well, we really, we want to train a new generation so they can train more people. This guy's going to live that long compared to somebody who's in his teens. So we're going to take our resources and dedicate them to somebody younger. So I don't think he's unique, but he's unusual. Tom, you had another question. Uh, yeah, just uh, just curious. Um, you had uh, mentioned that he took an American plane down to. Uh, somebody got out and yeah. <laughs> How did he get on that plane, and does he have a larger connection to the United States that he would have come here? Or? Um, so he took, I was able to piece this together just from the dates of when he went and, and looking at this, the record. So no, he flew an Ameri what, what became Air America um, later on. So I mean, it, but it was the civilian air transport plane that was basically military aircraft that were in the Far East at the end of the war. Then a lot of them went on and became this part of the civilian air transport. So he. He flew with that, so basically military plane, but not formally military plane. Um, they, why, why the Americans got him out, um, they don't say explicitly, but I think that anybody who was going, wanting to get away from, anybody who was wanting to get out, um, he, had, he had connections, he was a prominent figure, um, and he wasn't going to the United States, he was going to just get out of there, to get to Shanghai. Um, I actually can't remember whose plane he flew to Hong Kong. Should be able to remember that, but I can't. Um, but then he has no other contacts with the United States. I know that Lockteau, um, so Lockteau goes on, it's another story, Lockteau goes on, first goes to Hong Kong in like 47. He goes there, he hates it. He, he goes hate, also because he's afraid of being called a collaborator? Why does he leave? Okay, so he first goes in 47 because he thinks, okay, Answer is Tom Quisil, but an American had gone there and given a talk about Buddhism in America in Qingdao, given this talk. And Lok Cho heard this and he talked with Tan Xu. He said, The way th this is going to be kind of the opposite of the way Americans often talk about China today, He's saying that America is going to be the big market for Buddhism. So if we want to expand Buddhism, we need to go to America. If we're going to do that, we need to speak English. If we're going to learn English, we should go to Hong Kong. So, they, so Lok Tho goes to Hong Kong to learn English so that he can 
then go abroad, presumably to the United States, but to the English-speaking world. And he gets there and he hates it. He hates everything about it. Um, he hates the weather, he hates the food, he hates the fact that he can't understand what people are saying. Um, he hates everything about it. So he goes back, and this is kind of a, a <laughs> this was funny in whatever reading it. So he goes back then to um, Qingdao, basically to say, I went to Hong Kong, I'm never going back again. And they've already decided as soon as he gets back that they need to go to Hong Kong. <laughs> and so it's like, welcome back. It's like, God, I hated Hong Kong. And it's like, we're really sorry to hear that. You need to go and back to Hong Kong and find a way to get Master Tan Xu into Hong Kong. Um, and that's what ultimately does. And Lok Tho stays in Hong Kong with Tan Xu until the very end of his life. And it's kind of heartbreaking. He, he doesn't want to leave because he thinks Tan Xu is near the end of his life. But finally, you know, time is going on. He says, well, I'm going to have, have to go. And he goes to the United States. He'd been in the United States for a couple of months when Tan Xu dies. Then he goes back to Hong Kong for the funeral and then spends, spent the rest of his life in, um, in the US. He does go back to China late in his life uh, in the 90s. He goes back to China to help rebuild some of the, reopen, I should say, some of the temples that Tan Xu had, had founded. But he didn't stay there. When was it that uh, Tan Xu died? He dies in 63. In 63. I was just wondering, I mean, in this age of internet, and given Chinese genealogies and so forth, whether there's any evidence uh, of his descendants, of his you know, seven children and their families. Um, so what I said to some people, so, so this book, so the, this is the, pap the paperback is just now out. The hardback came out a couple of years ago. Um, so I've actually stopped writing the book a while ago. I looked for his, I mean, I would love to find that. And I wasn't able to find some then. It would be worth looking again just to see what I could find, but I'd not be able to find it. Didn't you say record. that a couple of his sons became monks? A couple of sons became monks, but, but that's all I was able to learn. And I talked to Lok Tho, and he, and when Lok Tho was alive, um, what happened to Lok Tho is the first couple of times I met him, I mean, he's very, he was very funny, and very engaging, and very eager to talk about all these things. Um, then he had a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, and the stroke, it wasn't a real severe stroke, but what it meant that he could remember things that happened a long time ago, but he couldn't remember things that happened more recently. So it became very stressful to, for him to talk because he, he could tell stories, but then he wouldn't remember who he was telling them to. Mm -hmm. um, and so it became more and more difficult to, to ask questions of him. But he, he did say that two of Lakto's sons had become monks, um, but he didn't, know, he didn't know anything further about them. Jan, is one of your remaining four questions brief? Uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, actually, several people asked all my questions. Um, just, I, and I think you've. Uh, did his brand of Buddhism or his. His, his sect. His sect, um, did it differ much from. Uh, well, he's. What others. So the majority of people of Buddhists and the, the kind and what Lok Tho was propagating in the United States yeah, that so differ from what others are here propagating. Right, so so Buddhism and there may be people who know more about it than I do, but but um, so Buddhism doesn't work in the same way that you know, I was vaguely raised as a Protestant, right? So the idea is that like there's Methodists and Baptists and, and like you if you're one you don't go to a church of the other. It wasn't right, the divisions aren't that aren't that bright in, in most of Buddhism. Like the lines aren't, aren't, aren't that, that distinct. So, so he was Tentai. Um, Tentai is a, is a pure land, is, is part of pure land Buddhism. Um, but Tentai is particularly noted for being um, very scholarly, very textually based. And so he would, um, Tan Shu in particular, would object to people he thought were dilettantes. So he felt that like you could become a Buddhist, you could be a Buddhist just by very, really making no commitment to to the, the, the teachings, and just um, taking the, the the smallest of steps into that world. Whereas he felt you really needed to to understand and go deep into what the what the teachings were. So Tintai was more was more serious from his point of view than some other than some other brands. Now that didn't mean that he would reject those others. He would simply felt that that they were not making a complete. They were they weren't going far enough. So, I think part of the reason why Tian why Tan Shu is, has less impact than someone like Tai Shu 
Um, Taishu is very much about a modernizing force. So Taishu lets her redo the curriculum and wants to start teaching foreign languages and mathematics in the Buddhist schools as a means of making this really part of a modernizing group. Well, I think Tanshu felt that he wanted to modernize China. It was much more about, he was much more about the spiritual aspect to that. Um, and so he wasn't, well, he wasn't opposed to what Taishu was doing in that regard. He was not, that wasn't what he was emphasizing. We have come to the end of our hour. I think that was really fascinating. And please join me in thanking Jay. Thank you for coming.